Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we now have a keynote address on philanthropy, investing in human capital, and that is to be delivered by His Excellency Atiku Abubakar, former Vice President of Nigeria. Atiku Abubakar is a Nigerian politician, businessman, and philanthropist who served as the second elected Vice President of Nigeria from 1999 to 2007. Atiku is a founder of Priam Group, a conglomerate with interests in media, banking and finance, agriculture and plastics. He is also a co-founder of Orlean Invest West Africa, a holding company with a wide range of subsidiaries. Among the most significant of these is Intel's Nigeria, responsible for integrated port logistics and facilities. Your Excellency, a warm welcome to you. We're really honored to have you today, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Your Excellency, Governor, Lagos, faculty, staff, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to participate in this very important summit and in this panel. As Africa struggles to live up to the expectation as the next big investment Frontier, it is appropriate to focus on what will be the key driver of Africa's development, and that is Africa's human resources. In this panel, we have been asked to speak about how we are to use philanthropy to identify, motivate, train, and reward people in such a way as to promote development in Africa. Development, a contented term, means to me the efforts to increase the productive capacity of a society, improve the people's well-being, and expand the frontiers of freedom while protecting the ecosystem for current and future generations. Philanthropy and entrepreneurship have helped Africans build schools, roads, churches, and mosques. Through philanthropy, many Africans have secured scholarships, employment, startup capital for businesses, and cost of medical treatment. An individual's success is deemed to be of limited social value if it does not lead to the success of others, either in the family, or clan, or the community. I point this out to underscore a very, very important point, which is that the link between philanthropy, entrepreneurship, and human capital has a long history in Africa. <coughs> now let me tell you my own story. Like other Africans fortunate to achieve modest success, I have engaged in virtually all these forms of philanthropy and more. However, the bulk of my efforts has gone towards fostering formal education in my home country, Nigeria. Some of these has taken the form of providing university scholarships for promising young people. Let me say that the British sent my father to prison so that I can go to school. And I don't hold that against the British. <laughs> but rather, I am thankful that I was forced to go to school because if I did not go, I wouldn't have been here talking to you. 
Some of it has taken the form of creating and supporting a first rate boarding school, kindergarten through high school in Yola, the capital of my home state, Adamawa, in Nigeria's troubled northeast, a very poor region of the country. But my largest commitment has been to the American University of Nigeria, the university which I founded a little more than a decade ago. You may ask why the American education of Nigeria? Because it's the only American university in sub-Saharan Africa. The other American university we have in Africa is in Cairo. There is no any other American university. And you may begin to wonder or ask why. As I was um, telling a story a moment ago, in 1960, Nigeria gained its independence. By 1961, I was admitted into the secondary school. And by 1961, all the British teachers who were teaching in my secondary school were departing back to England. And there was a vacuum. What happened? In 1961, the late President Kennedy introduced the Peace Corps. They came in large numbers and they took over the positions the British left. And that was how I now began to get in contact with the American system of education. So throughout my secondary school years, I was taught by the Americans. There were college graduates, some of them in their early 20s, 20, 21, 22. I just met one of them who is a professor at uh, Stanford in, in, in United States. That's why my largest aspect of philanthropy is directed at education. This two American University is located in Yola, far from Abuja, the federal capital, and far from the important commercial, industrial, cultural centers of Nigeria. When I invited the American University of Washington, D.C., to come and sign a management agreement with me in Nigeria, the leader of the delegation said, Atiku, but why Yola? We have come here. There is nothing we have seen. It's just a barren land. Why not Abuja or Kano or Kaduna or Lagos? I said, well, it has to be in Yola. Because my first contact the American system of education was in Yola. So if those peace corps could come all the way from the United States to Yola, there was no air conditioning then. I see no reason why the American University should not start from Yola. I would like to tell you about what we are building together and the role this small private university has begun to play in the sustainable development of my country. But wouldn't it be more cost effective, you might ask, just to use that money to provide scholarship funds for students to study elsewhere, to study, say, in London. A great many more students could be sent to LSE with the money now being used to run our AUN power plant and construct our buildings and pay our security force and the like. My concern, however, is to help develop my country in deeper and more holistic ways. Why should we want to facilitate the brain drain out of Africa? To enable our best and our brightest to take their ambitions, their intelligence, and their drive to London or New York. Just like what a last speaker was referring to you as expatriate Nigerians. We need them in Africa. We need you in Africa, not in Europe. We need them to understand the problems in Africa. We need them to pitch in. In these challenging times, it is worth asking, why is higher education important in the world? What does it contribute to society? And why is AUN important on the continent? When we think about the impact of higher education, we often think of 
only the private individual benefits of higher education for the student. We know from a great deal of research, for example, that individuals with bachelor's degrees earn more income over a lifetime than those without, and that they become more productive managers, entrepreneurs, and innovators. We know that. Of course, increasing individual income is important. But higher education is expensive. And these purely individual benefits are hardly enough to justify the significant cost of running a modern university, especially when you look at the often doubted challenges faced in most African societies. However, we know that there, is, there are far broader benefits to the wider society from higher education. Higher education not only boosts individual incomes of its graduates, but also the overall GDP of African nations. A recent study estimated that a one-year increase in Africa's stock of institutions of higher education with no other action will raise output growth by 0.63% per year, boosting incomes about 3% after five years and by 12% over a decade. Of course, increasing economic growth is absolutely essential for all African countries. But development is more than merely increasing incomes and enlarging GDPs. Development, sustainable development, is about improving health care, preserving and enhancing the environment, developing good governance, and increasing human welfare, especially for the poor. How does higher education contribute to these goals? Societies with widespread access to higher education have the following. Better health indicators, increased life expectancy, and reduced infant and child mortality, reduced fertility rates, and increased saving rates. Imagine all this. In addition, Studies have found that controlling for income, societies with widespread access to higher education are more democratic and more politically stable, have stronger human rights and civic institutions, have reduced inequality in income, have lower crime, and have improved in, the, in environmental indicators. Beyond these characteristics, there are other things to consider. In the 21st century, we live in a new world, a world where information and communications technology has changed the way we work, the way we think, and the way we even play. For African societies to grow out of poverty and to compete successfully on the global stage, the technology, skills, and attitudes attendant upon the widespread use of computers and the internet must be made widely accessible, not only to university students on the African continent, but also to everyone, especially the poor. For the poor, more than anything, lack of knowledge, information, and resources are very costly. <coughs> what kinds of information? Information about market prices, about weather, about good health practices, about how to handle disasters such as flooding. All of these are things that need to be widely known in places like Yola. This is one of the areas where AUN can and is already making its mark. AUN is, I believe, one of the first universities in the world whose stated mission is to be a development university. It means that we are focusing our teaching and research on the problems of development in all of its senses. Literacy, economic planning, sustaining and restoring the environment, entrepreneurial skills, public health, the whole spectrum 
of human endeavor. But beyond what happens in the classroom and the library, we are taking the knowledge, the information, and the solution developed in our university and applying them in the local community in Nigeria, in West Africa, and eventually in the whole continent. In establishing our development mission, we drew inspiration from the American land-grant universities, which helped make America a world power. Advances in agriculture and industry moved from American universities and colleges to communities through agricultural extension agents. It was a deliberate government-supported project for places such as MIT, Ohio State, and UC Berkeley. Originally, those extension agents from such colleges and universities taught farmers how to prepare land, apply fertilizer, and grow better crops. In the 21st century, all of us in higher education have to be different kinds of extension agents, knowledge extension agents, developing new knowledge and applying those solutions in our societies. That is what we are doing at AUN. Here are some examples. I believe you must have read some of them somewhere or heard about them. Our TELA program, Technology Enhanced Literacy for All, now funded by the United States Agency for International Development, is using the old technology of radio to reach 20,000 vulnerable out-of-school children in our surrounding community. Let me tell you about this. This is not anything new. In the First Republic, all the way from Kaduna, Northerners used to be educated through the radio in what used to be called, in Hausa language, Kakoi Karatu, learn to read and write. Suddenly it disappeared. Now we are bringing it back in another form. Two thousand of these children in our pilot program are being taught using tablet computers of applications written in Hausa and Fulfulde, our local languages. Fulfulde, of course, is a language spoken by the Fulani uh, stock, whether in the northeast or northwest or north central or in the whole of West Africa. These literacy applications were written and uploaded by our computer students. Students from our School of Arts and Sciences have designed the content for the radio program episodes. Our math and statistics students are conducting the monitoring and evaluation to see which technology is the most effective. Students. <laughs> the driving force behind all our development initiatives are students not the faculty. Our students are acting as facilitators in 750 learning centers in Yola. In the process, all are coming to a far deeper understanding of the challenges facing my country and are gaining useful experience in helping to rise those challenges. This is integral to their training at AUN. No matter what course you are taking, Entrepreneurship is compulsory in AUN. That is why today a sizable number of our alumni are job creators. They are either employing 10 to 20 people either in Lagos or in Abuja or in Torakot. This is not the experience they would have were they to have left school Nigeria for education abroad. I took back two of my sons to AUN and they confessed. That's a different kind of education they are getting. So why is this literacy project important? 
Nigeria, like many other African countries, is experiencing very rapid population growth. My country's population is doubling about every 27 years. Right now, we won't have enough trained teachers to teach and classrooms in which to learn. Unless we develop new solutions for education, by 2050, when we are projected to be the third largest country in the world, we will be a country full of uneducated, angry, and hopeless young people. <laughs> Technology is essential for mass education, and AUN as a development university is pioneering a new way to educate in Nigeria and Africa. AUN is located in a part of the world where terrorists are trying to tear apart the country. Of course, you must have heard about Boko Haram. Their home is in the Northeast. <clears throat> so four years ago, worried about the rise of Boko Haram, AUN reached out to all the local Muslim and Christian religious leaders, as well as local business, community, and educational leaders. With their support, AUN leadership established the Adamawa Peace Initiative. If we were an ivory tower, we would just close our gate and don't bother what goes on around us. One of our most successful programs has been peace through sports. Christian and Muslim boys and girls who had never met each other play on unity teams, teams comprising both Christians and Muslims. <laughs> AUN provided training in peaceful conflict resolution as an integral part of this sports program involving over 5,000 children, some of them most vulnerable in the area. AUN can document that not one child in these programs joined the terrorist group. And in spite of two local government bombings, Yola has remained peaceful, calm, and united. We have never closed school for even one day. This is what it means to be a development university and have an impact in your society. Our AUN students have been deeply involved in this and other, and other Adama Peace Initiative projects. As the violent insurgency to our north grew in intensity, Yola was flooded with refugees, doubling the size of the city to 800,000 people. The Adama peacemakers took care and fed close to 300,000 internally displaced people who sheltered in Yola for close to two years. This is what it means to be a development university. AUN students and faculty were at the forefront of these humanitarian efforts. Students from our School of Information, Technology, and using our advanced technology wisely. AUN students developed the first e-voting system in the country. I just watched them vote two days ago in their students' elections. E-voting. AUN, according to the American Library Association, now has more digital holdings than Oxford and Cambridge, and our e-library has won the association's award. <laughs> but we don't keep these resources to ourselves. Our love program, Library on a Flash, has created 53 libraries in our poor region of northeastern Nigeria, from primary schools to universities. This is what it means to be a de development university. <laughs> there are many other examples of how AUN has become a force for improvement in our city and region. Waste to wealth has over 700 women taking the plastic thrush from the streets and turning it into six beautiful products and into building materials. Feed and read works with over 400 poor boys and girls, many of them orphans, providing one meal a day from local food vendors while teaching them to read using new technologies. I participated many times in this. 
our students once again are in the community learning about the real problems of the country and learning how to solve them because they are the future leaders. You have probably read about the kidnapping of the Chibok girls. Is a wall, I mean, um, headline. Chibok is a community to our north, and a handful of these girls managed to escape their Boko Haram captors at the very early stage of uh, the kidnapping. Our president moved to Chibok herself to pick those girls, a very brave woman. At AUN, we are now educating 27 of these remarkably brave and resilient young women on full scholarship. <laughs> and when I had access to see the donors who are those donating $1, $2, most of the donors were either from Europe or from United States. Nobody was donating from Nigeria, very few. One of them recently expressed what education means in our area of the world, and I quote her. Education gives me the wings to fly, the power to fight, and the voice to speak. <laughs> this is what she said. That is why I founded the American University of Nigeria. Let me say, however, that while philanthropy has an important role to play in developing Africa's human capital, the primary responsibility for this lies with African states, like states everywhere. Private efforts, including philanthropy, are not a substitute for carefully targeted and efficiently managed public investments in these areas. Investment in human capital is not simply a cost, it is the most investment to produce skilled and healthy workers and acknowledgeable and engaged students is critical for Africa. Let me also say that economic growth and employment and wealth creation are not just socially important. They are also critical for the, traditional for the national security of African states. High levels of illiteracy, unemployment, and social annihilation of the populace, especially young people, are linked to widespread discontent, criminal behavior, and indeed militant insurgency. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. And let me apologize for my inability to appear or honor your previous invitations. Thank you very much. Your Excellency, Your Excellency, on behalf of everyone present, on behalf of everyone present, Your Excellency, may I say how honored and privileged we feel to have had you with us this afternoon, mindful of your very busy agenda. Your address was indeed thought-provoking and inspiring, and we are all certainly the wiser for listening to you. It was especially interesting, I thought, to learn more of the wonderful work of AUN, and you can indeed feel justly proud of the positive difference it has made to so many people's lives since you established it in 2004. Ladies and gentlemen, please, another wonderful round of applause for his excellency. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we now come to the final panel discussion of today, focused on philanthropy investing in human capital. And just before I introduce the chair of the panel, perhaps I may be allowed to just uh, comment on the objectives that we seek from the panel. 
The objective of this panel is to bring attention to entrepreneurship programs and philanthropic initiatives that invest in Africa's lucrative human capital. Philanthropy in Africa has shifted away from merely giving back as both investors and beneficiaries are now seeking sustainability and ways to track impact. The panel will provide insight into available programs and services that select, train, mentor, and grow next generation Africans and equip them with the necessary skills and platforms. It will also present investment challenges such as retaining human capital and creating incentives for brain gain and explore how to address them. Panelists will share best practice from examples across the continent and will emphasize the impact of these programs on individuals, their communities, and Africa's economy in general. And I now move to introducing a good friend of mine, actually, who is Okendo Lewis Gale, who is going to chair this panel. And Okendo is author of Haram Beans, and founder of the Harambe Entrepreneur Alliance, HEA. HEA is a network of highly educated young African entrepreneurs who are spearheading social and business ventures across Africa. Efforts which have been recognized by The Economist, by Forbes, by Vanity Fair, by China Daily, and indeed by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, amongst others. Born in Costa Rica and raised in Italy, and educated in the United States and Taiwan, Akendo is currently an MPA candidate at Harvard Kennedy School, where he has been awarded a full scholarship by hedge fund manager Glenn Jubin, and is a member of the prestigious Mason Fellows Program. It is therefore with little surprise that I can tell you that after hearing Okendo speak rec recently, President Barack Obama famously said, I am glad Okendo is not running for president yet. <laughs> oh goodness, oh Clive, oh Clive. Uh, thank you so much. Clive, uh, to be honest with you, I don't know whether I should thank you or cry. <laughs> you have now raised the bar so high, it can only be downhill from here. Uh, I don't know who he was talking about, but I assure you that person is not here today. Uh, so the instead... Queen, the Queen told me. Oh, that's who it was. Uh, but thank you so very much for those kind uh, introductions, and thank you all for being here today. I, I, I particularly like to... I guess, Clive, what you, what you didn't tell him, though, is that then the president said uh, that if he had run, he would still be president. <laughs> <laughs> so really, uh, not a concern. But um, I do want to thank the dream team here at the London School of Economics for bringing us all together. Thank you all. Congrats. Thank you. I'd also like to thank Craig uh, Calhoun, the uh, director, for allowing us to use the uh, strenuous con uh, convening power of this institution to bring all these amazing individuals. I, I have to admit that I feel woefully unprepared to be up here. Uh, we have a, a vice president, uh, three very accomplished CEOs, and then little me. <laughs> and I, um, I, I will try to do my best, but uh, I don't know if I can live up to it, but as I, as I was trying to think about what this panel is all about, as Clive mentioned, uh, I ran into a wonderful cover of The Economist. I don't know if you've seen it last week, but uh, we are back on the cover. Uh, <laughs> now, we are not the hopeless continent anymore. Uh, it is not Africa rising. We are now making Africa work. Woo! But there is a wonderful piece in here that I think really helps us crystallize what our gathering here is all about. The continent's future is in the balance. Whether it bounces back from this commodity slump or slips back into stagnation, war, autocracy, will depend on whether enough of its leaders 
keep moving forward. While its past was defined by commodities, its future rests on the productivity of its people. And that, my friends, is why we're here. Because we have used the wonderful convening power of this wonderful institution to attempt to see what can we do, whether in the philanthropic realm or the entrepreneurship realm, to equip its people uh, with the resources and opportunities that they need to be productive. And, and so uh, and, uh, we, we have here with us um, Par Parminder Beer. She is the Chief Executive Officer of the Tony Alumilo Foundation. Ms. Beer was awarded an Order of the British Empire by Queen Elizabeth II for her services to the broadcasting and film industry in 2002 and was, has extensive experience in media, entrepreneurship, uh, and business development. At the foundation, Ms. Beer manages the Tony Alumilo Foundation uh, Entrepreneurship Program, which has invested over 1,000 entrepreneurs so far. LSE has brought us Parman Beer. Welcome. Welcome. And we have a video. Oh, three. <laughs> oh boy, oh gosh. Well, 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 come on up, we'll get the video, and uh, is it easy to, to get it started? Oh, are we starting the video? Okay. <laughs> I thought he was gonna introduce the entire panel. <laughs> okay. Is it easy to do? Yeah, yeah, this question. Okay, yeah, we'll set it up. All right, so once she set it up, we'll, we'll continue with the distinguished panel. Uh, Firas Lajil is co-founder of Zones Inc. and chairman of the LSE program of for, Af for African Leadership Foundation. Um, he owns the FANA Group of Companies, an investment holding company operating in the United States and Canada. He was born in Uganda, <laughs> uh, attended a bachelor's degree in the Great London School of Economics in 1969 and attended... <laughs> as well as the Harvard Business School. <laughs> Don't take it personal. <laughs> uh, uh, his philanthropic contributions include the Program for African Leadership here at LSC, uh, um, which has integrated scholarships and support for training uh, leadership across the continent. Uh, LSE has brought us Firoz Lajid. Welcome. We have also with us Sangu Dele. Mr. Dele is the Chief Executive Officer of Gold Pond Investment. He's the founder of a philanthropic initiative called Clean Aqua, which provides access to clean water and sanitation in Ghana. Sangu was named one of Forbes' top 30 most promising entrepreneurs in Africa in 2015 and was awarded Euro Money's Africa's Rising Stars, an award for outstanding individuals and power brokers who are changing the financial, investment, and business landscape, landscape across Africa. Sangu is an impact investor and ha who has successfully restructured several businesses across the continent. LSE has brought us Sangu Della. <laughs> and then, of course, we have His Excellency, Mr. Vice President. Uh, thank you so very much for being here with us again. I, I, you've had several introductions, so I, I, I don't think <laughs> I, I can add anything to that, but thank you so much for being uh, with us. Do we have a video? So can I put just the context for oh, this? Oh, sure, please. So, I mean, so you're about to, I, you know, I'm a filmmaker and a storyteller, and I believe that a picture tells a, th you know, a, a thousand words. And rather, and no amount of words that I tell you about the vision, the impact, the size, the scale, the audacity, the ambition of Mr. Alumalu will do justice than five minutes of you experiencing um, the Tony Alumalu Entrepreneurship Program. And then we can obviously talk about this structure, et cetera. Thank you. Okay. You can roll the video. <laughs> Basically, I am a Nigerian by birth, but I'm African in everything I do, from my investments to my philanthropy and to everything and my essence. I believe that no one but us will develop Africa. 
and growing up, you know, I've always uh, felt that every one of us is equally as endowed as our friends and meets in other parts of the world. And I felt that it was a matter of time for us to prove this to the world. My vision was to help empower the next generation of African leaders. Government is to set the right environment, but the private sector must take lead and take charge. Having been an entrepreneur myself, uh, let me help to create more. That is good. Driving forward behind the Tony Elmenu Foundation. My life has come, as I said, in a full circle because today, the lucky entrepreneur I was at some point with today embark on the journey of giving back to the continent it has been so much to me and doing it, if I may say so, at an unprecedented level. Through the Tony Elmenu Entrepreneurship Program, I am committing 100 million US dollars to support the next generation of African entrepreneurs. The program represents a decade long commitment to support 10,000 African entrepreneurs and startups. The program is open to entrepreneurs from all 54 African countries. Over the next 10 years, our goal is to generate a million jobs through these 10,000 businesses and to help contribute at least $10 billion to revenues across Africa through these businesses. I'm from Ghana. My business is in the IT sector. I'm a fashion designer from Nigeria. What we do, we replace candles and kerosene by making solar lights affordable for the people who are living in Madagascar. The founder of Grits Fresh Foods, which is the company that aims to promote healthy lifestyle in Africa. And I'm from Zambia, Lusaka, and I'm in the health sector. I'm developing a solution which can help farmers manage their farms as a business. Ladies and gentlemen, we also have the founder of the Tony Elemental Foundation, the chairman of Hair Tonics, Mr. Tony Elemental CEO. weekend was a surprise appearance from the Vice President of Nigeria, the Prime Minister of Benin Republic, and the Governor of Kaduna States, who all spoke on the importance of supporting entrepreneurship across Africa. As you pursue your ideas, when someone says, this is impossible, reply with two sentences. One, nothing is impossible. Two, Impossible only takes longer. When I see you, I will not say I have a dream. I will not even say I have an expectation that you succeed. With your values, creative values, and these convictions that people is everything, more important than capital, people and their knowledge, people and their ambition, I have not a dream. I have not an expectation. I have a certainty that you are the winner. Tony Elumelu's initiative goes beyond creating entrepreneurs. He has shown by this project that social entrepreneurs are is creating opportunities for others using commercial methods and strategies is fundamental to development. I want to charge you all in your own little ways to become like little Elumelus during doing your own bit to create opportunities for others. Africa indeed today stands ready to seize the future. I say so because of you, young entrepreneurs who are here. Your creativity, innovation, talent, and most importantly, strength of character is our future. Let me say how extremely proud I am of you all. I'm sure that your countries and our continent will be safe in your hands. Congratulations and thank you very much. Self-belief and the power of vision, he told them, are what carried him forward. My name is Ahmed Abbas from Egypt. Uh, from I had Egypt. a dream, yes. I had a dream to connect with our African brothers and sisters and you have made this dream come true. I believe by my economic philosophy of African capitalism, 
that the private sector has a role to play in the northern continent. But in our environment, we have stifling conditions. Access to finance, seed capital, ease of doing business, mentoring. And to me, it's about legacy. It's about you all. Imagine just put yourself in my position and working in my own in my age, for instance, that I visit Zambia and someone says, I own this financial institution or I own the manufacturing company. I own this. Do you know how I started? So I said, No, I got $10,000 from a certain man from Nigeria called today because that's how I started. That's my mission. Thank you. I so you can imagine the 1,000 people in that. It was the university campus in Otta in Lagos. And we flew 1,500 of them are from Nigeria, the 1,000 entrepreneurs on the 2015 program. And they, for many African entrepreneurs from across the 51 countries, this was the first time that they had traveled from one African country to the next. And the business relationships that, that have been built as a result of that. Already our entrepreneurs are doing businesses with each other. They are co, um, they, you know, they, they're setting up business partnerships. There was one entrepreneur who was a doctor setting up a diagnostic um, business, discovered there was another one setting up a diagnostic <coughs> business in Zambia they have formed a partnership. There was a woman entrepreneur who came to us and said, I want to set up a, a motor mechanics workshop for women. Um, because we as women, when we go to get our car fixed, we don't have a clue. And it's as if we're, you know, the person is speaking in foreign language. And there's a cafe and, and places where the women, she now has the Uber's account in Lagos. And that's from, and I can tell you hundreds or literally a thousand stories of seeds that have been planted through the Tony Olumulu entrepreneurship. <coughs> so when I look, when you, are, when you experience something like that, you can only think about Africa as, an, as a continent on the move. And you can only think of its demographic, the young demographic. Our entrepreneurs are from the age of 18 to 64, I think, <coughs> our oldest entrepreneur. 21 to 37. Um, to 37 is our major entrepreneur. And finally, I just like to say that, you know, what shocked us when we read the 20,000 applications and we read them all in, in, in the foundation, we were amazed at the number of young, on, young African entrepreneurs who see agriculture as a business opportunity. And that was repeated again this year where we received over 45,000 applications from 54 African country. The only country that we don't have represented is Eritrea. So I just share this with you that there's one man with a vision, and his vision was to empower 10,000 entrepreneurs. My role in, in the God conspired to bring us together in April 2014. Um, I was thinking of retiring, and in fact, no, I was, I was in fact retiring. And he threw this challenge. He said, I have this vision. Will you come and help me? Help us operationalize this vision. So my only, the only bit of the credit that I take for it is I took his vision. And working with a small team in the foundation is to create a long lasting um, framework and a structure for a program that is sustainable, that is made in Africa, by an Africa, for Africans. And, and it's not a program that we've taken an offshoot of any American or European entrepreneurship program. And very quickly, the entrepreneurship program is training. It starts with the toughest application form you can fill. Are there any Tony Alumulu entrepreneurs in the audience? And would, can you stand up? And mentors Woo! as well. can listen to them and they can speak about 
their experience. But it begins with the toughest application form you've ever encountered. To really to distinguish grantpreneurs, those who think entrepreneurship is about getting grants and aid, to those who recognize that entrepreneurship is the toughest thing that you do in life. I'm an entrepreneur, I know, yeah? Um, the second is mentoring. And mentoring comes from anywhere and everywhere. And we have a thousand mentors together with a thousand entrepreneurs. This year, you know, we have a thousand. Last year, we didn't have enough mentors for the program. The networks and networking that we have done online and offline, as you've seen, and all of these entrepreneurs in their own countries have built networks, yeah, country chapters, where they continue to, um, to meet with each, each other. Only two days ago, I hosted the Tony Lumlu Entrepreneurs 2016 in Cote d'Ivoire, and this was the first time that 20 of them had met each other. Um, and then, obviously, we follow it up with seed capital. We have two rounds of seed capital. One is a non-returnable um, seed capital investment of $5,000. And you note I use the word seed capital investment and not a grant. It's non-returnable. But we do have an expectation of return on our investment. And I'll talk about that much later. The second is structured financing because we want to teach our entrepreneurs how to get themselves investor ready. So when they go to meet this guy here who is private equity, they are talking his talk and they're presenting um, themselves as a best investable opportunity. And then obviously Africa's largest, biggest entrepreneurship um, network in, on the continent of, of African entrepreneurs, already 2,000 in the network, plus 65,000 who didn't get into the program who remain part of our network. But we'll talk more. Oh, thank you. Oh. <laughs> No, thank you all. Thank you so very much for that. And it's very inspirational to see the impact that uh, Mr. Lumilu is having uh, and the fact that he has begun this very important journey. But one of the beautiful things about LSE is that they brought all kinds of expertise and insights to, to our gathering today. So uh, one of the things I've tried to do is get as much of that as possible. And I kind of see a few areas here. Um, uh, some of the best practices uh, in training some of the entrepreneurs, some of the uh, the measurements of how do we measure impact of that these uh, individuals are having. Uh, the policy aspect, of course, how do we ensure the governments uh, perhaps can facilitate uh, the entrepreneurial ecosystem so that more young folks um, can be trained and, and, and have that. And of course, I think a very deep understanding of, of, of both the challenges and opportunities that entrepreneurs face. But I'd love to try to get a sense of the audience here. Um, uh, so I got a few questions. Please raise your hand if you are an entrepreneur. You define yourself an entrepreneur. All right. Uh, raise your hand if you're a philanthropist. You, you love humanity. There you go. All right. Uh, raise your hand if you actually have had a venture focused on education or whether training or, or anything of this nature. A good group of people. Uh, all right, and, uh, and finally, raise your hand if you're actually here for the after party. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. I, 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 I knew there would be always a few people here. Well, that's coming, and I think the panel starts at 10 p.m. <laughs> but I do want to really try to get some insights here from folks. And um, uh, for, 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 uh, Firoz, you, you've, you've actually worked here at LSE, where you've trained over uh, through what you founded, your philanthropist yourself, the very definition, it actually has helped LSE uh, train over 180 uh, young Africans who've been coming to this program, to this wonderful institution. Uh, and I think the goal is to have at least 100 every year for the next few years. And, and I think you've probably seen a few important trends. What works, what doesn't work, as we try to uh, get, uh, equip people with the resources and opportunities they need to succeed. So could you perhaps share with us a bit about the program, but also what, you, what is working from your perspective. I mean, let me start with a little bit of background. Please. Uh, <clears throat> I was born in Uganda. My wife is from Kenya. My mother was born in Kenya. My father was born in Somalia. Wow. I've been in the United States for 40 years, and this is my connection to Africa. Uh, I'm a businessman and an entrepreneur, and I have a foundation and the, one of the missions of the foundation 
is uh, higher education. And so my journey started with why not do something for my alma mater, the London School of Economics, where I graduated from, and I owe my success to this institution. Uh, so it started with me endowing a scholarship, uh, one student from Uganda every year to do a master's program over here. And being a businessman and an entrepreneur, I took interest on the students who were coming here. And I would see the transformation take place. You know, when they first came, I mean, they were very, very bright. And after getting educated over here, you know, and see the transformation and, and a vision started to form. Could you get closer to the mic? I guess yeah. we're trying. And the vision started to form that really these are going to be the future leaders of Africa. And, and that's where the vision of PFAL came about. PFAL is Program for African Leadership at LSE. Um, to create and implement this vision, obviously you need support from the highest level, from an academic institution. And so I approached Professor Craig Calhoun and later on Professor Tim Allen. And I realized that not only I was going to get support from the highest level at LSC, but there was a shared vision about what and how LSC can impact Africa. And if you can just visualize uh, leaders flowing from here. And we're talking about leadership, not just political leadership, but leadership in all walks of life, whether you're running an NGO or a, an institution or a hospital or a village or, you know, whatever. Do it right, you know, enable others lead properly, and, and in the process would bring about change in Africa, you know, social change and economic development in Africa through strong leadership. And so that became the basis of uh, the vision around PFAL, highly supported by uh, Professor Craig Calhoun and, and, and Tim Allen. And, and then the foundation that I formed, PFAL, we needed to give it a little bit of a structure. So we had an office with its management, Gerald and Ingrina, communications, all that was formed. And then the scaling process started. So I committed to 15 scholarships per year for African students from Sub-Sahara, was matched by LSE. And so the scaling process started, and then Gerald came up with the idea of uh, you know, inviting uh, students who are already at LSE to join PFAL. And so now the group is becoming larger. And, and Have you seen some things that are working that you, you yeah. think are important to share yeah. with us? So, so things that are working, you know, a lot of students come over here and they mingle and, and get educated and go back. But the PFAL students created a leadership code which became the basis of PFAL. And the leadership code is around governance, gender equality, transparency, ethical leadership, giving back to their communities. And they subscribe to this philosophy. And one of the best practices over here is it's very easy to get lost in this institution, you know, and we want them to network with people from all over the world. This is a global institution. Mm -hmm. But we bring them once a month to a, to a program where we have debates, and the debates are around the leadership code, you know. And one of the most exciting debate is a subject that says you need a little bit of corruption to survive in Africa. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> and, Anybody and, up for that debate? <laughs> and, 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 and you should see the dynamics that flow from that, you wow. know. And, and so that's the best practice, you know, to, to create a social network, uh, 
a lecture, a debate, and ability for the PFAL alumni to engage with each other and then keep that alumni together through a communication vehicle where they can post blogs, they can communicate with each other, express their views, and then we uh, created a new best practice of having an Africa forum. The last one was in Uganda just back in January where we bring the alumni together and connect everybody again together. So that's... And how many of these uh, debates you do? Once a month. Once a month? Yes. Uh, must be on, a lively on, discussion. On different <laughs> leadership subjects. Wow. Gosh, thank you. Very exciting. Thank you so very much for sharing uh, some of that. I think this exchange of ideas in constant forms that allow us for, for that cross-pollination is important, very important. Uh, Mr. Vice President, I know that uh, protocol requires that perhaps we start with you, but I figure that if we ask you to speak any longer, you start charging LSE. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to be nice to the school. No, in fact, I expect you to ask me to speak the, the last because uh, <laughs> so I, I gave the keynote address. So, I, uh, <laughs> so I, I love to perhaps get uh, uh, Sangu. Uh, uh, Steve Rose just mentioned gender inequality, and I think it's something that you've come to uh, come to appreciate. Uh, you've just gave a TED. Oxford talk, um, but I think you really can speak uh, both to the issue of uh, the gender disparity, but also uh, how do we measure the impact and the success? And I think as someone who's putting money into these companies, that is a very important question to you. <laughs> right, so I think for me it's been, it's been an interesting journey. Growing up, my father's a doctor and a human rights activist, and I remember we grew, I grew up with refugees from Sierra Leone and Liberia because they, a lot of them migrated to Ghana. So as a kid, I was, I, I, I always say, I became a social just, I, I became a social justice advocate by baptism by fire, right? Because yeah, I was about five years old and I'm seeing these men with, you know, chopped off arms and I'm asking what happened and they tell me horrifying stories of being asked shorthand or longhand, time back, right? And so as a kid, my conscience was stayed. <laughs> And my childhood was ruined to a large degree, where I, I, I believe that I had to do something to make a difference. I remember when you mentioned the hopeless continent, I remember that day, I can never forget that day, I was on my way to school, and the hawkers who sell newspapers and magazines, my, my dad and I had a deal. He would buy the magazine, I had to read it within an hour. By the time he drops me in school, you know traffic, and I'll give it back to him. And I loved The Economist, it was my favorite. That day, I'll never forget, I looked at it and I just, I turned to him and I said, Papa, why do they think we are hopeless? Because I didn't, the hopelessness they were talking about, I didn't see that hopelessness. Wow. So, long story short, I end up um, being involved in a lot of humanitarian work. I, I got a scholarship to attend Harvard and started an organization to do water and sanitation work. We're now working in 120 villages in Ghana. But something, something really shifted my philosophy on how to give back. One day, I got the whole community of Ejimante to get together, and I asked them, if I have World Bank budget, and there's one single thing I can do for your community, what would it be? I thought people would say, oh, give us money, you know, build a school, build a hospital. The answer shocked me. They said, Yepe Juma, we want jobs. So right then, then I realized that, look, we can sit here and talk about philanthropy and what we need to do for Africa, but a lot of times we need to go on the ground and ask people what they want. People want economic empowerment. <laughs> and that's why I started Golden Palm Investments, wow. to say I want to back the greatest ideas that are going to transform Africa. One of the, th one of the things that was transformational for me when I was at Harvard was, was thinking big. I realize sometimes we tend to have this culture of mediocrity, paucity of ambition, where, you know, it's almost, and it comes, part of it comes from my educational curriculum, where children are not encouraged to be critical thinkers. Shut up, don't talk, right? <laughs> no, it's true. <laughs> and, and I'll never forget the day, I, the day when I first started Golden Palm, my classmate, who was one of my first investors, when we were first talking about the deal, I was very timid, African boy style. I said, oh, I mentioned some small amount. And he told me, he said, Sangu, if that's your ambition, I don't want to invest with you. I want someone who's going to come and tell me that 
this is where you are today, but this is where you can be tomorrow. And that forever changed my life. And that's the philosophy I use when I'm back in entrepreneurs. So going on how we measure impact. Mm. I look for entrepreneurs who are, look, over the next 35 years, one billion babies will be born in Africa. We don't have time to sit and dignity double over small things. If we don't think big, the gains over the last 30 years, we're going to lose it. Because if you have a billion young people in cities and you think you can sit in your nice house in Ikoyi or East Legon and you'll be safe, think again. <laughs> so I started looking at impact from a standpoint of how do we create jobs and how do we solve our problems? And that's one of, in our, one of the companies in our portfolio is called M Pharma. Young boy, Gregory Roxon, graduated from college in the US, had a job to go and work in Silicon Valley, and he had a story about a woman in Kolibu who, this woman was given a prescription for a drug. She had a heart condition. They went and they were looking for the drug. Five hours, traffic, going to pharmacy, 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 they couldn't find the drug. The woman died because you, because you had to go to five, six different pharmacies. I mean, it drew him mad. So he left his job offer, moved back to Ghana, started this company called M Pharma. I met him, it was a napkin stage, and he told me, look, I have this idea where if we can create a digital system, have, e have the doctors e-prescribe it, put in all the pharmacies on the network, we can immediately tell you, you need a drug, go here, it has the drug. And now we can have information on drug efficacy, we can have information on who's consuming the drug. So I, I backed him, invested in him, he started that. He started it and he realized something interesting. Patients were going to clinics, but they were not picking up the medicine. So we looked into it and we said, why is that happening? Why? Because when Pfizer makes a drug for $100, in Africa, by the time you buy it, it's two to $300. So cost of drugs became a problem. So we then said, let's lay on another system. We used our electronic system and brought insurers and manufacturers together. And we've, we just piloted in Nigeria with Hygieia and we've brought the price of drugs down by 50%. Woo! That, that is impact. And he's doing Nigeria, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, and Zambia. So, and when the goal is to do all 54 African countries. And by the way, it's not charity, we are making money. <laughs> entrepreneurs who are in the same space, they should get in touch. Absolutely. There you People go. already invested in them. Yeah. And they're ready. No, exactly. You, know, you see that? LSE magic already. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for that. We want jobs, Sangru. I, I, I do think that that is a very important thought to keep with us. You know, I, yesterday I was fortunate to, the folks at Oxford invited me to come to it for a day-long discussion on Africa with a number of business leaders and insight from the university. And one of the business leaders, very prominent one, as around the table, then said something that I, I think we all ought to be asking ourselves. He said, you know, when you look at the continent and all the trends, and this huge population growth, uh, you know, the youngest continent on Earth, and we know that by 20, 50, all of these projections about population. And yet you look at the real challenges, the lack of infrastructure, the, the fact that we still are not educating enough people, uh, the fact that we still are not, some of the opportunities are not reaching enough. And then you have to wonder, uh, if even, if, even if you want to be an optimist about where we could be a few years from now, the question is, will it suffice? Will it be enough? Will we be looking back 10, 20, 30 years from now and saying, well, that was a good idea, but it just didn't work out, particularly because the, 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 the scope of the challenge is such, a number of jobs that we would have to create are such that is sort of um, perhaps beyond our reach. So, so uh, Carmen Del Brown. I belong to your <laughs> pessimistic club. I'd love to I hear your thoughts on this. I go by my own story. I was born in India in a village um, you know, to a very poor, in a very poor family. Mm. My, we didn't have flowing water, we didn't have electricity. My father got, well, my father migrated to the UK and then we followed at the age of 10. So when I left India, it was 1965 and it was the basket case, right? Mm. 1991, something happened in India, right? So I grew up in the UK fighting racism 
being caught up hacky, go back home, and I was thinking, but this is my home. Why are you telling me to go back <laughs> home? Um, uh, but India never left me, and I remember, you know, returning in 1980, the conditions in India were poor. You know, I mean, it was like a basket case, yeah? And then something happened in 1991, um, and the liberalization that took place, the economic reforms that government put in place, the Sunil Mittals of Airtel, the, 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 the Tatas, I mean, you know, the, uh, the re Reliance, the, the Anil Ambani's, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like, in, you know, the, the hundred, um, um, you know, the business leaders. A lot of those people emerged from in between post-liberalization. I now, I never thought that in my lifetime, the West would be saying, we want to get into India. We want a piece of India, yeah? <coughs> And that is exactly what I saw from 2000. To the extent when I sat here, I said to the UK Film Council, you cannot ignore the power of the Indian media and entertainment industry. You have to be in India. And within 2000, and 2000, 2005, the entire American Hollywood studio system had moved to India. To the extent now, it's the Indian studios who are bailing out the Hollywood studios. So don't tell me that Africa cannot Woo! achieve that. That's it, is its human capital. That is exactly what India, when the government got its act together, and that's all Africa needs to do, the African <laughs> government leaders, um, if they can get, if, they, if, you know, now more and more you are seeing how the African state government leaders and the private sector leaders. That's what Mr. Alumalu's philosophy of Afri-capitalism. I agree that if, if that does not happen, if the private sector mm. is not unleashed to do what it is good at, which is creating jobs, which is creating wealth, from the startup enterprises that we're investing in to the second stage investments that you're doing, right? Um, to the scholarships, and, and creating the future leaders, but the governments across Africa and the private sector leaders, that is the solution. It is the two working together for the economic and social development of Africa. I've seen it in India. I fundamentally believe that it will happen in Africa, and we will not be here with your pessimistic story. <laughs> so, so I think if I had to paraphrase what you're saying, it's yes, we can. <laughs> uh, Mr. Vice President, Mr. Vice President, Varman Deer just mentioned the G word, governance. <laughs> governance. And this is an important topic, isn't it? Because if we're going to unlock that potential, we're going to have to get some of those economic reforms that India saw in the 1991. We're going to have to get the, the government and our politicians and our leaders help us build the infrastructure needed for this. Where are we on this? Is there hope? How, are we, how is it going from your perspective? <laughs> well, um, as I said earlier on in my you know, contribution, uh, the entire subject of philanthropy uh, will be incomplete without also the government you know, assuming a large you know, uh, a sector of, of, of it, in the sense that no amount of philanthropy, no matter how, how, how large expanded, because it's, of course in philanthropy it's, it's a mix. You know, every person takes, or every uh, individual takes, you know, what he feels he should be from, uh, from entrepreneurship to job creation to education, and so on and so forth. But the most important thing is that the government has to step in and ensure that there is an enabling environment uh, for philanthropy itself. Have you seen any, any be things working, best practices, perhaps within Nigeria, across the continent? Have you seen something where you're like, more, we need more of that? Uh, organized philanthropy in, in, in Africa, or let me say more than philanthropy in Africa, is, is a little bit new. Okay. Uh, of course, we have traditional, you know, African, you know, philanthropy, <laughs> you know, like, uh, you know, in Nigeria, you have mentoring, um, uh, you know, varying from one part of the country to the other in skill acquisition, trade practices, and so on and so on. But 
contemporary or modern philanthropy uh, is, is, is fairly new in Africa. It's just being organized, you know, on a very, uh, uh, you know, national level or continental level, uh, like, of course, the Tolu Elumelu Foundation. Mm -hmm. And there are also a couple of other foundations in Nigeria who, who do the same um, kind of thing. But um, an organization, uh, a contemporary one, is, is, is fairly new in Africa. Have you seen, perhaps in your interactions with some other politicians across the continent, a shift in the discussion, a, 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 a perhaps an interest or a desire, or are we still sort of? Hmm. Yeah, honestly, <laughs> I, I must be honest with you, I have not. <laughs> <laughs> There's hope. <laughs> no. Because, because uh, there is this uh, perception, you know, that particularly if uh, you are a politician and you decide, you know, to be a philanthropist, there is the perception issue. Mm. And so most successful uh, businessmen, because I was a businessman before becoming a politician, uh, so uh, most of the time there is a perception problem, mm. not until, uh, you know, the concept is very well developed. What can we do to try to help that along? Have you... I think uh, public enlightenment, you know, and um, but whether we like it or not, uh, the philanthropies that are emerging uh, nowadays on the African continent are also a force to be reckoned with, mm. whether from the private sector or from the public sector. Yeah. And so whether we like it or not, it is uh, yeah. a development that is inevitable you know, uh, to happen. Wow. Uh, Please, please, please. You know, I just wanted to share an example yes. of, I mean, just taking the Tony Lumlu Entrepreneurship Program. Of course, when we created it, we want it replicated and want that model to travel. And I was amazed when we met the Minister for Entrepreneurship mm -hmm. and SMEs in Cote d'Ivoire. Ah. And we were sharing a panel just like that. And we took him, you know, I did a presentation. And he said immediately, how can I replicate this program wow. just for the entrepreneurs in Cote d'Ivoire? Wow. We've signed an MOU. We will provide them with all our intellectual property, wow. i.e. the structure, and they will provide the infrastructure um, to bring how many wow. ever entrepreneurs that they want to bring to the program plus the seed capital. Wow. The governor of Kaduna, again, who spoke, asked how many you know, entrepreneurs from his state were there, and they, and they said, okay, I will host you when you come back to Kaduna, he did. Wow. And he said, so what are your problems? And one, you know, they said taxation. Mm. Do you know it cr yeah. kills us, mm. right? So the enabling environment, and, and mm. that's, you know, the foundation also devel has, de has developed his research and advocacy. Anyway, but there and then he changed the taxation system wow. for, in the interest of wow. startups and, and, and early stage enterprises. Remember, our foundation is working at the most riskiest end. Wow of the entrepreneurship value system. This guy is working at the <laughs> slightly the safer end because he backs, you know, he doesn't start with an idea, right? No, I okay, okay. Do. Oh, you do? Yeah. Okay. So I, I go across the I board. I was just challenging. I'm, I'm opportunity agnostic. The, the, <laughs> right, it's like where there's opportunity. I mean, the way I, to be honest, I started, I started as an entrepreneur. I found kebab in Ouagadougou and saw it was cheaper than Accra. Traced it back and found out cows were cheaper and I took a truck and bought cows. And that, that's literally how I started. But okay. I, want us to, I want to have a little caution, though. Mm -hmm. um, it's easy to get swept up in this euphoria of Africa rising, come here, clap for ourselves, Africa, we're doing it. <laughs> There's a tale of two Africas. There's the Africa of Gregory Roxon and M. Farmer. There's the Africa of the Teeps. There's the Africa of all this greatness that's happening. It's also running six of the 10 fastest growing economies in the world are in Africa. Mm -hmm. But this is happening in parallel with the fact that seven of the 10 most unequal societies and countries in the world are in Africa. Yes. And the Africa rising <laughs> is leaving women behind. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a big issue. It's a, it's a missed opportunity. I, 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 I gave her the TED Oxford talk on, on why our economic freedom is linked to gender equality. We have an, to me, gender equality in Africa is an opportunity. Why? Because we have the highest rate of female entrepreneurship in Africa. More women start businesses in Africa than anywhere else in the world. Yeah. Right? In fact, in Nigeria, women entrepreneurs outnumber men. So it's a situation where, and check this out. 
McKinsey did a report that said that when women start businesses, every dollar of additional income, 90 cents is reinvested in their family's health, education, and nutrition. Men, 40 cents, because we are buying beans. <laughs> Well, necessary. Right? 90 <laughs> versus 40. So I'm not, I'm not coming here to tell you, oh, feel good, the women. It's an economic case. It makes sense. Woo! Let's invest in our women. It's, it's an asset we have. I think I, I, I will support Woo! you. <laughs> no, I, I, will, I will support you very, very strongly in that. In that, in my sub-region, I establish a microfinance bank. Huh. And I gave management instructions that 80% of the loans should go to women. Woo! And believe me, the rate of repayment is 98%. Wow. But, That's true. Wow. but the 20% that we give to men, <laughs> We, 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 we don't recover, and then when we give them, <laughs> when we give them, uh, you know, they end up marrying other wives. <laughs> so, um, we, it's marriage finance, it's not microfinance. <laughs> uh, <laughs> wow. In, so really, if you empower a woman, you empower a wow. whole family. No, yes. but... As the woman on the panel. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's really important because I've also studied all the indexes around entrepreneurship. And you know, and, and when I and I looked at all the the, the countries in Africa, across Africa, and I suddenly saw that the gender scale was high wow. in terms of the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Why? Because they were all in the microfinance, right? Mm -hmm. And these are women. So that the idea of having skills, mm -hmm. the tools, the ability for that woman entrepreneur to go out and raise the next round of finance, mm -hmm. um, to scale her business. So the ambition of microfinance for women entrepreneurs is very, very low. Mm -hmm. And if I was, you know, talk, uh, you know, my <laughs> call to women entrepreneurs is don't go there. Mm -hmm. Build your business, educate yourself, mm. and actually, um, you know, work on the same level as as male yeah. entrepreneurs. Yeah. And you know, I agree in in terms of our, um, what shocked me was that women came to the portal in same numbers as men to apply, but they never completed the application. And that showed mm. to me is that they lacked confidence mm. because the questions in the application are tough. Wow. They're tough because they're asking you to talk about your business feasibility your market opportunity, your financial understanding, your scalability, right, and your entrepreneurial skills, yeah? A lot of the trader, the women who are microfinance candidates are, are traders. Mm. They don't think like that. And I think we need to, you know, I want as many women business owners to go and pitch for private equity and mm. venture capital and, and bank loans and angel investments, yeah? yeah? And to be taken as seriously, seriously. as when a man goes to them. No, so you. don't underestimate the skills that you need to develop, grow, and sustain a business, yeah? Wow, well thank you so very much for that. And, yeah, and, and, and my, but, 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 but in all, in all <laughs> these. Well, uh, Mr. Vaj, I, I think that both you and Ms. Sangu will be very popular at the after party. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but before, perhaps I wanted to get your input perhaps just very briefly from him as well, yeah, would you? I, I think the government has a very important role to play in terms of making it easy for people to form businesses and run businesses. Mm -hmm. In Africa, it takes too long. I know I have friends who are starting businesses in Africa and it takes forever to get permits or get wow. approvals. You know, it's just everything takes too long. And I think government has to that play a role in that. that area to facilitate the ease of doing business. And if you don't mind, what I'd like to do, because we've we got about a few minutes here left, but I'd love to try to get a few questions. And I have the oh, feeling that there's a few burning questions. So we'll take three. <laughs> I don't know how we'll do this, but uh, uh, <laughs> clearly from a woman. Yes. <laughs> At least we could start with one. 
Please, yes. Only the women are raising hands. Here. Exactly. <laughs> what gender equality? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to come to you and invest in libraries in this market. Good afternoon. My name is Ibiso Wanchuku. Um, first of all, permit me to go off on a tangent. I'm an alumna of AUN, and I can bear testament to the ac academic excellence of AUN. So thank you, sir. <laughs> now to my question. Um, the business of a business is to make profits. So how far should a company go um, in tending to the needs of the society without overstepping its boundaries and encouraging the government to renege on its duties? Thank you. Thank you. So we'll take another one. Please make the note of that. Uh, this young, there you go, sir. With the black tie, right? Thank you very much. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank the organizers of this event. Uh, thank you very much. Secondly, uh, thank our esteemed uh, panel members. Uh, Your Excellency, thank you very much for gracing this occasion with your um, presence. Uh, thirdly, is my question, and it's um, on human capital development, and particularly in Nigeria. And um, I do recognize the excellent work uh, you're doing um, at um, the American University of Nigeria. Uh, but you mentioned the statistics. I was looking to quote to you. Uh, by 2030, Nigeria will be uh, the fifth largest, we have the fifth largest population in the world. 2050, we'll have the third largest population in the world. Essentially, uh, by 2050, Nigeria would, uh, will have doubled its current population. Right, so we have that, which looks very impressive. That's good. However, my question to you is, do you believe the current approach to human capital development in Nigeria is effective enough in preparing Nigeria for its multifaceted development? And before you answer the question, I'd like you to consider the fact that um, rough conservative estimate states that 50% uh, of 7 to 14 year olds in Nigeria are out of school. And this is primary education. So for 7 to 14 year olds out of education, in, by 2050, we'll have the, uh, the third largest population in the world. How, what preparations are we making to ensure that Nigeria is able to develop sustainably in the future? Thank you. Thank you. you. Woo. And then one last one over here. I got this is tough. Anyway. Sir, there you go. You're waving. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, sorry. Thank you Hello. very much. My name is Femi Odusi from the London School of Tropical Medicine. There was a question that was asked uh, during the panel discussion, and it was that, does it take a little corruption to do business in Africa? I'd like the panel to answer that question. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. We, uh, so we've had a few issues here. Delhi, what would you like yeah. to take? Um, I can talk about the impact one, and I'll leave the others to do the corruption <laughs> one. <laughs> <laughs> so I always say this about Africa. For an entrepreneur, Africa is like heaven. We are, there are problems left. Everywhere you look, there are problems. <laughs> but every problem is an opportunity. So to me, I don't see impact and profit as mutually exclusive. In fact, I see impact as sustaining your profits. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. In the past, a lot of the business, most people who call themselves businessmen in Africa for a long time, it was trading. What you're basically doing is you're importing something from China or Europe, you throw a margin on it and you sell it, and that's what we call business. Right? Most of the people were doing trading. The value add there was very little. Mm. Over time, you've seen a transition, you've seen a change. Take healthcare, for example. We have 11% of global population, 26% of global disease burden, and that's exacerbated by the fact that we only have 3% of global healthcare workers. I mean, this is a clear case, and healthcare is actually one of the most lucrative sectors globally, some of the highest return on invested capital. So this is a clear situation where Africa is one of the few places where you can make money as a businessman and go home and actually feel good because you're solving problems. M Pharma, I mentioned, reducing drug pricing by 50%. We're making money, right? And you're still solving all these issues. And when you do it, it's able to, in some ways, when people even say impact, I don't know why there's a dichotomy. I don't understand why in, this 20, in, in the 2016 and going forward, you want to actually start or run a business that's actually going to have a negative impact on society. When you have so much opportunity to do better, let's raise the bar. 
Let, let's, I, I really hope that 10 years from now, the word social impact will disappear, because all business should be social impact. Woo. I have our, our wonderful timekeeper here reminding me that even though Africa is heaven, we are past our time. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, but, but I'd love perhaps, to be, is there a question you, you, you hear that you'd like to take on? No, the only thing I'd say is let's not evangelize entrepreneurship, right? I, I'm an entrepreneur, have been an entrepreneur. It is the hardest thing you do on earth, yeah? We choose to be job creators as opposed to job seekers, yeah? Um, if we're creating jobs, and we're creating wealth as a result of our product or service, we are making a social contribution, yeah? So I, you know, what, that's so my first thing I, when I meet the entrepreneurs on the 1,000, uh, the 1,000 from 2015 and the 2016, is we don't want to put lead balloons on their ankles and then say, <laughs> now walk up the Himalayas, yeah? It, because they've already chosen, they've already taken a risk. And, and, and you know, the only thing that I would ask is that the government, through legislation, through regulation, and through you know, the enabling environment that they, that they can create, is that they make it easier so that we can focus on job creation and, and wealth creation, which can make a social impact on society, and, and, and not have to spend so much of our time dealing with red tape. Thank you so much. Piroz, please. Yeah. You'll have the last one. <laughs> yeah, I think I'll give you my viewpoint on what the students have to say about okay. corruption. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and it's been a very interesting debate because it's on the background of PFAL that promotes ethical leadership. So I guess the first question that people ask is, are you giving bribes to facilitate or are you on the take? <laughs> okay. The vast majority of the students uh, held their ground and said that they have to be principled, they have to create a value system and promote the value system and not participate at all. You know, and it just sets a trend. It's very difficult. You just end up with more obstacles in getting your results accomplished. But there were uh, few students there who said they had run businesses, they had run into a lot of obstacles, and they stood their ground and said they would never give a bribe and have succeeded beyond their wildest dreams. And, and I think that's the kind of uh, dialogue wow. that's happening over there that's very impressive uh, as far as PFAL is concerned. Wow, thank you for sharing that with us, really. Thank you very much. Mr. Vice President, yeah, I'd like thank, to give you the closing Thank you very word. much, um, uh, Mr. Moderator. Let me uh, make an attempt to answer the question of the gentleman who wanted to, to know what will happen uh -huh. you know, to our booming population by uh -huh. 2050. Um, I said it in my presentation that um, the, the, the most sustainable uh, aspect of philanthropy is, is education. Mm -hmm. And uh, once uh, our governments in Africa, you know, are prepared to review and change, you know, the way our education system is, is implemented uh, so that we open it up to creating, uh, uh, educating people who can uh, create jobs rather than you know, merely becoming job seekers, yeah. you know, in the job market, I, I think we'll be able to take care of, okay. of this. So as far as I'm concerned, education is the most sustainable yeah. aspect of philanthropy. Wow, yeah. well, thank you. That, that really is all the time we have, but perhaps I, I, I'd love to get at least one of you to uh, share with us a vision and inspire us. Um, so what happens if, uh, you succeed. What happens if uh, uh, we had our way, we can train, perhaps Ms. Stella, you could, you could close us off here. What could happen if you could impact as many entrepreneurs and provide the capital? What, what's, what's that vision? Would you like to? Sure. I spent the last four years, I went to 43 African countries, interviewing 600 entrepreneurs for a book I'm writing. And at the end of the trip, I came to a realization, which is a prediction I'm making. Mm. If we do it right, if we succeed, one day our grandchildren 
will look us in the eyes and say, Grandpa, Grandma, you mean Africa used to be poor? Thank you.